So what's up, people? This is Robert Pisano. La Nate Veritas. Not what you know is what you can prove. Um, I was having a conversation with my partner in crime, John, yesterday, and uh, we were discussing some issues regarding the double slit experiment and quantum mechanics. And the topic of the... Uh, constellations came up. So I started doing some research on uh, European Southern Observatory's uh, website. And, you know, I wanted to revisit the issue of the fact that they're creating artificial stars up in the nighttime sky down in Chile with the very large telescope. This facility is called the Four Laser Guide Star Facility, the 4LGSF. Okay, in Chile. It dawned on me that maybe I should start looking for the data to clarify what the power and the capability of this laser guided star facility was. Meaning, how powerful was the laser and how far was it shooting lasers up into the sky to create an artificial star? So John and I decided, okay, let's check this out. Let's see if we can find the data. And lo and behold, they put the data right on their damn website. Okay? And I'm going to show you guys. This is absolutely mind-boggling, people. Mind-boggling. And if you can see it here, it's clear as day. It's clear as day, people. In this case, night. And they say it right here. Here you go. Here you go. Now, I don't want you Christian people and you biblical people to go crazy. But according to the European Southern Observatory, the 4LGSF complements the laser guide star facility. Instead of one laser, the 4LGSF sends four laser beams into the skies to produce four artificial stars by exciting sodium atoms located in the atmosphere at an altitude of 90 kilometers. 90 kilometers, people. That's about 295,000 feet from the surface of the Earth. 90 fucking kilometers. They're sodium atoms. They said that there's a layer of sodium atoms up in the atmosphere, in the mesosphere at 90 kilometers. Now, there are going to be people to argue to say, well, yeah, there's a sodium layer up there, so that doesn't mean that there's a dome and that's the limit to the sky. What about the Carmen line at 100 kilometers? Yeah, what about the fucking Carmen line? What about it? Because according to the European Southern Observatory, this bad boy delivers 22 watts of power. 4,000 times the maximum allowed for a laser pointer in a beam of a diameter of 30 centimeters. So you got four of these bad boys emitting 22 watts of power each. And they can only get to 90 kilometers? Around 90 to 110 kilometers. That's what they can do. Okay? 90 kilometers. People, your dome may be your dome the covered limit to our ceiling may be between 90 and 110 kilometers above the Earth's atmosphere. That's what they're saying. Okay? They say the fluorescent light that is emitted by the sodium atoms and collected by the telescope has been affected by the, by the atmosphere in the same way as the light emitted by real stars. So, the fluorescent light from the sodium atoms can be used by the adaptive optic system to measure and compensate for the distortions introduced by the atmosphere. Now, I'm not going to get into all this atmospheric science. It's something we're going to do for a later date because we're going to keep addressing this shit. Okay? But the fact that they said they're able to locate a layer of sodium in the upper atmosphere at between 90 and 110 kilometers, it might confirm what is below is above or what is above is below 
We got seawater at sea level. That's sodium. Highly concentrated. Salt fucking water. And you're telling me there's a layer of sodium above us? I got to rethink everything now. I got to rethink rethink things regarding the fucking lunar wave. Meaning the moon is within our atmosphere and it's floating around up there in some sort of fluid, dynamic environment. If you throw in superfluid helium with that, I, I just don't know. This this is this is real shit that we got to start experimenting with. Real shit. Because sodium, if you bring it down to almost close to absolute zero, like with helium-4, it's going to freeze over. Could that explain how the ice is coming out of the fucking sky? That is so, it, it, it's so cold up there that this shit just freezes over and drops out of the sky? There's been ice balls just drop out of the fucking sky. Has anybody ever tried to taste the fucking hail stone that came out of the sky to see if it's salty? This shit is giving me some serious food for thought, people. Serious fucking food for thought. 90 fucking kilometers. 90 kilometers. Which means that our entire constellation system, our entire fucking constellation system is no higher than fucking 110 kilometers, give or take. Meaning that all the fucking stars are somewhere around 300 fucking thousand feet, people. 320, 330,000 feet. After that, they ain't fucking nothing. They ain't no fucking stars deep out in fucking space. Now, that's just me fucking throwing that shit out there. All right? I'm not trying to be irresponsible about it. But if our fucking constellations or somewhere between 90 and 110 kilometers. That means anything beyond that, it's just nothing but fucking blackness. There ain't a goddamn fucking thing out there. So what the hell are they claiming is Mars, Venus, Saturn, Mercury, Uranus, Pluto, all these deep fucking Space nebulas, all this other bullshit. Where the fuck is this shit? Because according to ESO, our constellations are between 90 and 110 kilometers. And they're creating artificial fucking stars, four of them at one time. But wait until you see how this presentation progresses, okay? Just stand by. The Algoi Public Observatory lies amidst the picturesque landscape of southern Germany. As night falls, a team of scientists and engineers prepares to field test a very cool piece of technology, a laser guide star unit, which will soon be on its way to ESO's Paranal Observatory. This is the ESOcast. Cutting edge science and life behind the scenes at ESO, the European Southern Observatory, exploring the ultimate frontier with our host, Dr. J, aka Dr. Joe Liska. Hello and welcome to the ESOcast. Today we are at the Allgäu Public Observatory in southern Germany, because this is where a team of scientists and engineers from ESO is testing a brand new laser guide star unit. What's that, you ask? Let me explain. Now we've all looked at the night sky and seen the stars twinkling. Now the stars themselves of course don't do any twinkling. The twinkling is caused by turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. As the starlight crosses the atmosphere, it encounters different pockets of air with different temperature and pressure, which bend the light in different ways. Now, I don't know if you guys saw that, but there was sort of like an atmospheric disturbance, like sort of a wave, okay? You got to start thinking that lunar wave issue now. Because if what he's saying is true, this explains why 
that lunar wave is possible, or how it's possible. Thus causing distortions. In fact, you can see this effect often in broad daylight, whenever you look towards a distant object on the horizon on a hot day. Now the twinkling is all very pretty and even romantic, but for us astronomers, it's actually a real problem because it means that our images are blurred and less sharp than they could be if it wasn't for the atmosphere. So, what do we do about it? Essentially, we need a method to cancel out the distortions, in effect, to untwinkle the stars. The way to do it is to bounce the starlight off a mirror that is slightly deformed in exactly the right manner to cancel out the distortions. But how do you know how to deform your mirror? As ESO's very large telescope observes the sky, a specialised computer can pick a bright star and constantly monitor how it twinkles, deducing the atmospheric conditions above the telescope many hundreds of times a second. The computer then sends commands to a series of devices attached to a mirror in the telescope, bending and flexing it precisely in time with the atmospheric turbulence, cancelling out the distortion in the images. So for this correction process to work, you need a really bright star in the field of view of your telescope. But bright stars are very few and far between. And remember that the VLT was designed to image only a very small part of the sky at any given time. So for most observations, there just won't be a bright star in the field of view of the VLT. So what do we do now? Well, we make our own. 90 kilometers above our heads, in the upper atmosphere is a relatively thin layer of sodium. If you fire a powerful laser beam into the sky, you can make these sodium atoms glow, thereby effectively creating an artificial star for the computer to lock onto. In 2006, ESO installed the Southern Hemisphere's first laser guide star on the VLT. This system greatly improves the telescope's power meaning that the VLT can make even sharper images than Hubble for certain types of observation. But this is Did he just say make sharper images even better than Hubble? Yes, he did. He says that a ground telescope can produce sharper images better than Hubble, which is supposed to not be in atmosphere at all, okay? Supposed to have a clearer view of the nighttime sky than anything on the ground at 330 plus miles. That's what he said. So anybody want to still question if fucking Hubble is really where it's supposed to be? I think it's in the fucking ocean. Exactly what I said to the deputy program manager. And now when they're talking about there's this thin layer of sodium up in the atmosphere. And they shoot a laser at it to make it glow. Oh my God, man. This is just getting good. This is getting too good now. We're starting to put all this shit together now. Now this shit is starting to come together. Let's keep listening. The existing system has limitations. It can only create one artificial star at once, meaning it can only correct the telescope's vision for a small part of the sky at any one time. It's also very bulky. The equipment has to be kept in a separate laboratory and the laser beam fed along an optical fiber to the telescope. Based on the experience obtained with this first system, ESA engineers have been working to build a much improved new laser guide star unit. So Domenico, this is it. This is the laser. It's incredibly small. It fits on the back of this small telescope. That's amazing. Yeah, so this is what we've been working on the R&D for the past five years to make a 20 watt laser, very compact and lightweight, that it can be mounted directly on the back of the telescope. So we had to develop fiber lasers first and then develop this kind of laser heads. So you've just said it, it's a... And I've got this guy's cell phone number and his work phone number and his email address and I will be calling him and emailing him this week to have a live interview with him to discuss what he created and what the potential maximum capability of that laser may be. 
I've got a lot of questions to ask this guy, Domenico. 20 watt laser, uh, that's quite a bit of power, isn't it? Yeah, this is the, the power we'll need actually for the next generation laser guy star systems. And uh, right now, for example, in Paranal, we have about uh, 5 watt in the sky. So this is quite a jump in power. Is the laser beam that comes out at the end of this telescope, is it dangerous? What happens if I put my hand into it? Uh, if you put your hand, you'll feel warm, but you don't have to look into the beam. Okay, so it won't burn my hand, but what about airplanes? Is it dangerous for them? It's not dangerous for the equipment, so for the airplane, it's dangerous for the eyes of the passengers. And uh, this laser is above the maximum permitted exposure, so we have to avoid the planes uh, cross the beam. In fact, here where we are now, we have obtained a no-fly zone for above us, so we don't have a risk to hit a plane. The new device is more reliable, easier to maintain, and much smaller. In fact, as we've just seen, the whole unit fits into one small package, which is easy to mount on a launch telescope. Because it's so much smaller, up to four of these lasers can be installed on a single telescope, correcting the VLT's image over a much wider field of view. So what's happening here in Germany is that our team is testing the new prototype to make sure that it works perfectly before it gets shipped to Paranal. The facilities here at the Algoi Public Observatory are perfect for this, and what's more, they're only a short drive from ESO headquarters. Laser guide stars like this will be crucial for the forthcoming European Extremely Large Telescope, which will use adaptive optics routinely. The telescope will be many times the size of today's biggest telescopes, which should mean much sharper image quality. But this great image quality will depend on how well the adaptive optics and the laser guide stars work. Pioneering new technologies like these will make a big difference to the world's most advanced observatories of the future, especially the EELT. This is Dr. J signing off for the ESOcast. Join me again next time for another cosmic adventure. While we were filming this episode, we got a stark reminder of why ESO's telescopes are located on the mountaintops of northern Chile and not here in the hills of southern Germany. Thankfully, storms like this are not something you ever see at Paranal. So, when we look at this thing, you got to start asking yourself some questions. They can put four of these lasers on one telescope. The Paranal Observatory in Chile has four of these large bad boys. So they can, that means they can create four stars from one telescope, 16 stars from four telescopes, okay? Artificial stars. The artificial stars they're creating is they shoot these lasers at the sodium atoms up in the sky at 90 to 110 kilometers. Make them glow. Make them glow. So that they can get a fix on some other star they want to look at. But that other star can't be beyond 90 or 110 kilometers. It's got to be within that 90 or 110 kilometers. Period. That's what this facility is doing. That's how they're creating artificial stars. I wanted to know how they were doing it. And I wanted to know what the capacity and capability of, of, of this telescope was, this laser guide star facility. And they're shooting these lasers up in the sky at 90 to 110 kilometers. That's where your constellations are. Now, here's what I want to do. I'm showing you photos right now 
of the Egyptian pyramids on how the light was able to travel inside these pyramids. Look at the cosmic particle detectors. The light was able to travel inside these pyramids and outside of it, meaning it was collected somehow. And, you know, I got somebody else who's a YouTube channel, Lee Bracker. Lee talks about breaking down the fact that pyramid, pyra, means fire. Mid means middle. Is it possible that these pyramids were used for the same exact artificial production of some other light show? Is it possible? Is it remotely possible? that the pyramids were designed for the same exact purpose. Same exact purpose. Is it just possible? I mean, really. That's what we need to know. That's what I want to know. I shot this video before I had a chance to talk to Lee Bracker about it, but he's going to see this video. And I'm going to have him on and we're going to discuss this because there's been pyramids located all around the, the earth. Is it possible, aside from being burial grounds for royalty and pharaohs and kings and queens, when you look at the large, the very large telescope in Chile, there's four of them. So. If you want to compare that to, say, look at these bad boys as pyramids, modern day advanced technological pyramids, you got to decide for yourself. Because when you look at the pyramids of Giza and the pyramids in Maya and wherever else they're finding these pyramids, is it possible they were lined up with these fixed constellations in the sky? They were tracking these. Like you hear, you see this picture, Sirius, Orion, Draco, Ursa Minor, Ursa Major, Orion. Is it possible that the pyramids were designed for the engineering of what we see today? Could Egypt be the answer? Is Egypt the answer? To how all of this shit was created. How it was all engineered. Is what we see fucking real? Was it created by some creator? Should the Bible be looked at as a religious book from now on? Or a science book? On how everything is designed? Because according to the European Southern Observatory, there's a thin layer of fucking sodium at 90 to 110 kilometers. And they're shooting lasers up there, making these atoms glow to look like artificial stars. So that, that you have to ask yourself, what the hell are the stars made of? Because if you can shoot this 20 watt laser, could that mean that there may be, say, a constant generation of some sort of power, electromagnetism, electricity, like Tesla says, up in our upper atmosphere, right? The electromagnetic field, which is creating what we see up in the sky from ground level. Because once you get up above a specific altitude, you don't see shit in the sky. There ain't no stars. There ain't no stars. Everything is between 90 and 110 kilometers. There ain't nothing else. There can't be. Period. The electromagnetic field is potentially creating the perpetual energy to give us the light show that we see, the constellations, the Milky Way, all that shit.
European Southern Observatory provided the answer to this shit, man. For me, it didn't. But I want you, everyone, to comment. Give me your input. Give me some science feedback. Don't just say, oh, completely dispense with it because you don't want to believe it. You saw it for yourself. So the next thing I want to show you guys is this is a virtual physics experiment on bending light. Okay? Bending light. I use this for class. So as you can see here, you've got a ray, you've got, I could choose a ray or a wave. All right? So when you look at this tool, right, the material is air. All right? So if I've got, let me bring out the protractor, right? This sea level. Level meaning fucking flat. All right? And the material you got is water. So say this is the sun, right? Say this is sun. And then you put this bad boy, let's see, that's 40 degrees right there. Let's say 45 degrees. Say the sun is shining down on the earth at 45 degrees, right? All right. Index refraction for air is 1. All right? That's the index refraction. Boom. Let's see what happens. Sun's rays shining down on the earth at 45 degrees. Does it go through the water? What is above? What is below, right? Boom. Not only do you get refraction, but you also get somewhat of reflection. Because you've got this 45 degree angle reflection back up into the atmosphere. Back up into the atmosphere. You see that reflection off the water. But as you start to change the angle, looks like light can travel through fucking water. Now, I watched a video with someone telling me on the video that there's a possibility our world may be underwater in some giant fluid environment, meaning that the Earth itself, we're inside a, a con bubbleized, pressurized container like a fucking dive, a uh, 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 a diving submarine in the water, pressurized, we got our own environment, and then but above us is all this fucking water. So we gotta ask ourselves, how is the light shining through to us? Well, we're inside a contained dry gases and pressurized environment, multi-level level, and somewhere out above 90 to 110 kilometers is nothing but fucking water. Sodium at that, possibly superfluid helium. But when you see when I no matter when I change the angle of reflection and refraction, you know, look at it. You're getting reflection off to the water. Now let's change this for a little bit here. Let me change this for you. Let's change the material to water. Okay? Let's change the material below to air. And let's see what happens. Look what happens. If the sun is shining through water, if the sun is shining through water, right? We got water above, we got air below. 45 degree angle. You're still getting reflection and refraction. The light is bending. So if your clouds are here and people want to know why the light is shining through the clouds the way it is let me show you an example of so what someone sent me two photos that they took yesterday of the sun shining through the clouds let me show you now someone i know sent me this photo that they took yesterday they took this photo yesterday look how the sun look how the sun is shining through the clouds. Just look at that. Look, the light is bending. The light is being bent somehow, some way. It's a photo somebody sent me yesterday. That's a photo someone sent me yesterday. Okay? 
it goes the same photo. Just different angle. Look at the way the sun's shining through. You telling me that's a sun that's 93 million miles away? No. <laughs> Not fucking possible. Not like this. Not like this. Not based on this experiment. And this is vir just a virtual experiment, of course. But this is what's fucking happening. The sun at 45 degrees, shining through a, sodi a sodium layer upper atmosphere, 90 to 110 kilometers, reflecting and refracting, bending the light. I changed the upper material to water, the lower material to, 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 to air. To air. Now let's go with a wave. Let's see what a wave does. There you go. That's what happens in water. The wave is being, you have wave interference. Let's change the air, the material above to air. Let's change the material below to water. Look what you got. This is what you got right here. So rather it be a concentrated ray of light, particle, or wave, you get the same fucking result, people. Same result. Same fucking result. Now let's just say for argument's sake, okay? Let's say the bottom material instead of water is glass. Same deal. Same deal, okay? Let's say, let's go back to water. But let's just say the upper, what we're going through is glass. You still have partial reflection and refraction, bending of the light. I don't know what to tell you. I definitely have to look over this shit a little bit more, but here, here, goes, here goes some interesting things, okay? Let's do this, let's add prisms, okay? Let's add a prism. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to rotate this. And let's add a prism. We're going to do this experiment with John and these guys too. Right? So here you go. So what do we got? The objects we want, we want to go through air. Right? We want to go through air. We want reflections, refractions. Let's go with a protractor. Okay? Now let's bring that point. We want this at what? We want this at 45. Do we want this at 45 degrees? Yeah, let's let's do this at 45. Okay. 40 degrees, 45 degrees. Bring this bad boy back a little bit. Okay, let's see what happens. We got 650 nanometers. That's sunlight going through air. Boom. Look what we got. Look what we got. So what's this? this? Let's go with several beams. Let's go with, it's at nighttime. So let's see what happens when we go through water. Wow. How concentrated we go through water, and that's with a prism. Let's change this a little bit. Let's see what happens. Let's see when we change the angle of the prism to exactly 45 degrees. Look what we get. Just look what we get. Bending of the light. Yeah, we got to really experiment with this, custom objects. Let me see what happens when we go, the environment is water, but let's just say we switch it back to air, but the objects of refraction, look at this, 45 degree angle shading out, shooting straight down, so if whatever environment you have in your atmosphere, the sun literally could reflect the light back on, refract the light, the refraction is refracted Back in the almost in the opposite direction. Let me see what happens if you change keep changing that. Holy shit. Okay. Let's go with a different surface here. 
Let's see what happens here. Let's remove this. Let's remove I don't want to remove this. Okay, let me move that out of the way. We're still at 45 degrees. So let's just say this is your flat plane surface. Right? This is your flat plane surface right here. This is your earth. Okay? So again, we have, you're going through air. Let's switch the environment where this goes through with water. Look at that. Reflection and refraction on a flat plane surface going through water. This is, this is, re, this is what's happening. Right here. Your environment is water. The object of refraction is air. Gas. There's your experiment right there. I don't know what else to tell you, people. This shit is getting interesting. Very interesting. I'm going to do a series of videos to keep experimenting with this. This is just something that I found today. And I got the tools necessary. Now, let's see here. We got all kinds of things. We're going to play with this when I do the other video with, with uh, John and one of our other guests. Okay? But again, it's not what you know, people. It's what you can prove. I hope I added some sort of clarification for you guys. Because this shit just got interesting. Lasers. At 90 to 110 kilometers. There goes your dome right there. Right there. 22 watts of power. What do you think you can do with 30 watts, 40 watts, 50 watts? Think about that. Could you create a fucking sun? Could you literally create what you believe you see up in the sky as the sun if you multiply this times two or three or four? Is it possible to create the sun? I think so. But we're going to find out if it's possible. Peace out, people.